Hello there, you're very welcome to episode 15 of the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast. It's Jamie Moore here. Loads to come over the next hour or so. We're going to be joined live in studio by just a second by Shamrock Rovers' Sean Kavanagh on life as a hoop. His time in the UK and possible Ireland hopes as well. While our first division focus, we'll speak to the manager of Galway United, Shane Keegan, ahead of a massive game this Friday against Drada. It's second v third in the first division. Drada defender Kieran Kelly will be here as well. He's only 19 and he'll tell us what it's like going from playing in the under-19 league to playing in the senior league of Ireland. We'll also hear about the Waterford goalkeeper Lawrence Vigaru, who paid a £50 fine a very interesting way and about Shane Supple's Ireland call up as well that's all on the way but first we're very happy to welcome Sean Cavanagh to the studio Sean how are you? Yeah I'm not too bad how are you? Great thanks thanks for coming in uh, last night uh, Tuesday night uh, Shamrock Rovers 3 St Pat's Neil a game I was at in Tallis Stadium if you didn't know the form table and the fact that Pat's had won 4 in a row and Rovers had won 1 in 10 you wouldn't have known by looking at the match last night No the game was sort of completely different to uh, form wise as you said I think uh, we dominated the game, three 0 wins. So it says it all. I think we probably should have had a couple more. I had a, a decent chance myself near the end, and there was a couple of chances in the first half. But yeah, I think farm sort of went out the table, out of uh, out of the out of window last night. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's interesting because you know we've seen a lot of Shamrock Rovers this season. Certainly, I have, and uh, you know, interesting to look at the different types of goals that have been scored. Set pieces have been huge, and particularly on the side where the first goal came from on Tuesday, a corner by Graham Burke. His ability from set pieces is huge for Rovers um, and it's been a key part of the season. Just you know, explain to us how good he is because you're left foot yourself. In most teams, you would probably take corners, but he's a senior pro because he's so good with his left foot. Yeah, well, like you said, it's his sort of set pieces are massive. Even his free kicks, he had a couple last night. But just the corner, he just we spoke about where to put it and he literally puts it on a sixpence. He puts it where the manager wants it and we have people at the back like you seen last night. Lee Grace attacked one last night a couple of weeks ago. Pico uh, Lopez got one. So he's massive. He's he's unbelievable to play with. You can just give him the ball anywhere and he'll take it with anyone near him. Turn this way, turn that way, keep the ball whatever way you give him. So he's he's a massive sort of part of our uh, team going forward. Yeah, I actually watched the game with Stephen Kenny, the Dundalk manager, and we were just saying when the corner was given, I said, Jesus, Shamrock Rovers look really big. And you've got Ethan Boyle, you've got Lee Grace, you've got Roberto Lopez, you've got Dan Carr to name four. Um, I'm, I'm sure there was someone else who's quite big in the box as well. Yeah, it's, Ronan, yeah. yeah it's been a big a big part of the game. But when you have someone like a Berkey who takes the corners on both sides and you can put them in into you know areas where people will attack them, I think the second goal against Cork was the same. It was a corner by Graham and Ethan Boyle scored at the front post. It, it's a big part of, of how you guys play. Yeah, it's massive. Even like um, like you said, we have four big lads, and then midfielders Sam Bone, he's big. Ronan Finn, he's big also. So, um, well, it's quite a big team. And when you have someone like Graham who can deliver a ball, he can put the ball wherever he wants when it's on his left foot. Like, so that's always um, always a big chance for us to score, and we see it that way ourselves. And I think last night and against Cork, like you said, proved it. Yeah, um, if I was to say to you what the Shamrock Rovers and Bowes game would be like before you played in it. And now to ask you what it's like having played in it. There have been uh, two meetings this season. Bowes have won both, interestingly enough. You only played in, in the second one, which was in Talisade, in that dramatic game where Bowes won it in like the 97th minute or whatever it was. What did, or I suppose, did the game live up to your expectations? And what was it like to play in? Um, yeah, it was, it's frantic. Um, yeah, it's sort of in your face. It's, um, there's not much time on the ball. Um, yeah, it's a typical derby. I've played in a couple of derbies before, but I think this one's the most, I think most hectic and frantic, and literally it's all about the three points. That's all that matters. It's sort of a scrappy sort of game, but yeah, it's it's huge for us. It's huge for the fans, and I think um, after last night, we're going into it with confidence. Yeah, of course. Um, with the way that game went, Dan Carr giving you guys the lead. Dan Byrne scored with twenty minutes left. Things go crazy, and then there's so much injury time. 97, 98 minute, up pops Daryl Ehi with that shot. What were you thinking, standing on the pitch when that goal goes in? And you know, once the ball is tipped off, it's over, and you've lost the derby in such dramatic fashion. That's it's heartbreaking. As soon as you see the ball hit in there, you think it's it's over. We've lost. This, like you said, the 97th minute. As soon as we tip off, it's game over, and you're going in the dressing room. We shouldn't lose that game. We're one 0 up. Um, we give away the first goal and. We shouldn't give away a second goal in the 99th minute. Even if you get the draw, you take the draw. But you can't really lose it that way. Yeah, when you look back on the game and you know those matches against Bowes, like for us watching neutrals, they're so good to watch. And 
you know, was in the stand in, in Tala that night. And when the goal went in, it was just unbelievable to see the way that it happened. It would have been the exact same had, you know, the goal been scored at the other end and your team had scored it. What are they actually like to be involved in? Because they seem so frantic and so, you know, up and down and there's not too much uh, of a pattern to the games. They're just mad to watch. Are they the same to play in? Yeah, that's... You hit the sort of nail on the head there. With, there's not much pattern in the game. Like, last night, there's, we had a pattern of play and we sort of had a lot of the ball, I felt. But um, in the Bowes game, it's just like... Like I said, it's frantic. It's not much patterns of play. There's not much sort of keeping the ball here. It's sort of... It's 100 mile an hour. The ball goes over throw and you get you you want it in as quick as you can and people are in your face, which is a derby, which you, which you expect. Um, yeah, it's it's sort of frantic to play and it's, you need to sort of give yourself a minute or so to give, get a breather. That's what I felt in the first game. So hopefully I'll be more used to it in, on Friday if I play. Yeah, of course. It's uh, this Friday in Dalyman, 7.45 kickoff. Again, we'll be covering live here and off the ball as well. Um, that was the second match in the run of just, if we include last night, 11 games, just two wins, the 3-0 at home to Cork, which I was at, and the 3-0 at home to St. Pat's last night. What's that period been like with not too many wins? Um, it's It's been tough at times. Um, there's a couple of losses in there where we shouldn't lose, I think. There's a couple of games in there where we've played quite well, but lost a game down down to our own mistakes, and the lads have said that ourselves. We've sort of given people goals. Um but it's, yeah, it's it's always tough when you're not winning games and you're at a club like Shamrock Rovers. For me, it's being here the couple of months that I've been here. It's the biggest club in the country for me. Um, and there's pressure on you. And you can feel the pressure, but that's that's the, the perks of the job, I suppose, if you want to call it that way. You're at the biggest club. You, you have to win games. And hopefully this, this might start us on a little run now. Sean Cavan, you're robbing my questions. I have the word pressure written on my sheet here. <laughs> Um, and I wanted to just ask you about that and this word pressure is used all the time in yeah. football and by us journalists but when you're playing at Shamrock Rovers and everybody at Shamrock Rovers says Shamrock Rovers is the biggest club in the country in recent times in terms of results that wouldn't be true because Dundalk and Cork have done better but when you're in a run of, of the two wins in 11 matches and you know when you draw or when you lose straight away the result goes on Twitter and there's fans jumping down the throat to the players jumping down the throat to Stephen Bradley want Stephen Bradley out don't want him there don't think the players are good enough and then you get a result like last night, you probably feel that you know the run of what's gone on is is a process of trying to get better. But what's it actually like when you know one of those results happens and you realise that the fans are not too happy with you? Like, for example, that Bowes game, mm. the players went over to clap the fans. Looked like a bad idea because they just went mad. Um, yeah, it's, I think they have their, they have their right to their opinion. They, they pay for season tickets. They, they turn out, they go to Cork away. I remember Cork away one of my first games and there was it was a Monday night and there was a lot of fans there so you have to respect their their uh, their opinions but um, yeah it's it's sort of tough to be in like you just you're trying to go out there do your best for yourself for your team but the results weren't just weren't just clicking for us um, but when the fans like I said they have their right to their opinion and but there is pressure on you like I said for me it's the biggest club in Ireland maybe not like like you said, um, last couple of years, Cork and Dundalk have won leagues, but I think for me, it's a sort of sleeping giant. Like It's ready to, for me, right now, there's everything in place to win the league this year uh, in the next couple of years. Yeah, certainly from uh, an off-the-pitch point of view, stadium, best in the country, lots of good facilities and, and being built as well. You mentioned that, and I'm sure most managers and players are the same, you don't really care what the outside view is, you do care what your fans think. What's the inside view on the season overall when, you know, if we look at the season, if I can find the lead table here quickly, it's been, you know, an up and down season, but the mm. win against St. Pat's on Tuesday night brings you, uh, you're still in six in the league, but you're on 23, uh, you're on uh, 26 points now, should I say, so it's four behind Pat's and Derry and I think seven off Waterford and third, so all is not lost with half the season uh, played, but what's your, your thoughts on uh, seven wins, five draws and seven defeats so far? Um, yeah, obviously doesn't sort of look great with seven wins and seven losses but for me um, going forward I think we're four points off Derry and Watford uh, Derry and um, Pat sorry and um, the seven off Watford playing all them I don't think to be honest with you I don't think we have anything to fear I think we could go to any of their places beat them and beat them at home in, uh, in Tallis so for me I think hopefully this is sort of be the start of our mini season if you like we're halfway through the season but from now till the end of the season, we'd like to catch all them and maybe push on even more. Yeah, it seems to me from seeing a lot of Shamrock Rovers this season that 
the way the team has played, I know there was a, a change in shape a little bit through the middle of, of that run where you went to three at the back. It was back to a back uh, four in the match last night that there was no panic that Stephen Brady didn't panic. He remained quite calm. The same with the with the rest of the coaching staff and the players. Even if if you know fans and other people on the outside wanted to have their view, is, is that fair that you know you guys kept playing and even the highlights of the, the match in Sligo the other night that could have easily been a win as well. Yeah, well, everyone on the outside has their opinion, don't they? I suppose um, with the media and you say like you said, you go on social media and they, the first sort of result everyone looks for is Shamrock Rovers. Um, but inside in the dressing room. Everyone has belief in, like, if I'm playing, I have a belief, belief with centre-back midfield or left midfield, if strike, I have belief in everyone in the dressing room to, that I think we can score goals, keep clean sheets and win matches. So I think inside the club, everyone has belief in each other and just sort of kept calm and trying to keep our confidence up. Now, as we said, um, the words keeping calm are not too uh, used too often in the derby. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, the match away to Bowes in Daly Mount on Friday mm-hmm. where points are key for both teams because you know Bowes haven't had a fantastic season either they're only a couple of points away from the relegation promotion uh, spots themselves uh, and the fact that they've beaten Rovers twice mm. um, if if they can make it three it'll be incredible but if, if Rovers can win it jumps you possibly to just a point behind the teams just ahead of you Yeah like you said it'll be tough to keep calm sort of on Friday and that sort of hectic atmosphere the atmosphere is brilliant in the game that I played in and I expect the same on Friday so yeah, sort of get yourself pumped up for the game, but try and keep calm. It's sort of a, a tough level, I suppose. You're trying to get pumped up and win the game, but you're trying to keep calm if you get the ball to keep, obviously keep the ball and create chances and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's a tough one. It's sort of it's a balancing act, and hopefully we the eleven that go out and the eighteen that are involved and the whole squad will need everyone can do can do the utmost for it. Yeah, I think that phrase "fire and ice" comes to mind. Yeah. Fire in the belly and ice in the veins as well. What does match day involve for you as a League of Ireland player? You're playing in a derby on Friday night, 7.45, against Bowles away. How does your match day work? Um, I'll wake up sort of normal time, I suppose, bring my little lad to school. Well, I'll bring him down to the crash, I'll drop him off, and then there's, there's probably about four or five of us that go for a bit of breakfast before every game. So we'll meet up at the usual time, say 11 o'clock, have, have a bit of breakfast, um, go home, I'll sort of chill out. Um, during, during the afternoon normally have say a cup of green tea with me missus when she finished walks have the little lads watch a bit of telly with him and then sort of chill out then from breakfast up until about say about 4.15 start getting ready I'll have me pre-match and stuff like that if it's a home game we'll meet at the stadium at about 6 o'clock so 6.15 so probably leave the house about 5 just to allow yourself a bit more traffic and stop off for a coffee on the way that's, that's sort of my routine do you nap and do you cook your own pre-match meal? Uh, no, I'm not really a napper. I'm, I have, as soon as I sort of finish breakfast, it'll probably be about half twelve, one. I'll go down, get the little fella from school. He's normally finished at one o'clock, so I'll get him, bring him home. Like I said, I don't really nap in the afternoon, but yeah, I cook my own pre-match meal. It's normally <coughs> just salmon and rice. Every every sort of day, is, every uh, day of a match is the same for me. I could think of nothing worse in the world to eat than fish. I absolutely <laughs> hate fish. Salmon and rice, huh? Yeah. You're on the Off the Ball dry. League of Ireland podcast. It's episode 15 here. Jamie Moore in studio with Shamrock Rovers, Sean Kavanagh. Uh, we've loads more to chat about, including young Freddie, who's uh, Sean's young son, who's his biggest fan for sure. I want to bring you now some audio from the Ireland manager, Martin O'Neill. Of course, Graham Burke. Um, he didn't make his Ireland debut because the match against Celtic uh, the other day, the friendly game, wasn't an official international match. He made his first Ireland senior appearance, shall we say. He's also in the squad for the game against France in Paris and also the game against uh, the USA uh, coming up next week as well. Uh, now I sat down with Martin O'Neill the week before last. This was after Martin had witnessed Shamrock Rovers beat Cork City 3-0 in which Graham Burke scored a brilliant goal. Sean also played in the game and uh, played really well. So I asked Martin just about the form of Graham Burke, the goal he'd seen and if players like Graham who come home from England were doing well in the League of Ireland. Number one could go back to the UK and number two might even make his squad and here's what the Ireland gaffer had to say. He's been, um, in terms sorry, in terms of Graham Burke scoring fantastic goals, he played for one of your former clubs, Aston Villa, for a number of years. He's come back, he's doing really well in the league. I think he's played for Ireland up to the 21s. Mm-hmm. For someone like him, if their form is that good here, do you see a possible route back to the UK for him? And are those the type of people who you would be keeping an eye on in case they do go back and do, do a Sean Maguire or something and, and perform really well? well, the, well the, there's, there, there are a number of players now who have, gone, uh, who have gone over to England early on and had to come back. There's no reason. There's no reason for. And there might, uh, might be a number of reasons why they didn't make the grade. They might have been homesick, for instance, the the, the, the perennial problem. 
or they might just the, the other players just might be better than them. But if this is an opportunity for the lads to to regroup, go again, get a bit of confidence, and he, and he's doing very very well at this minute, and wants to try it back there again, that's all well and good, I think, you know, and. Um, uh, you know, for instance, I remember when I came into this job, first of all, um, I went to see some players um, uh, playing in, in, in England. Uh, the little lad uh, playing left back for, or, sorry, left wing back for Shamrock Rovers there. He played for Fulham. Sean Cavanagh. Absolutely, he, he was playing. He was playing intermittently for Fulham. He, he played quite a number of games, but obviously as Fulham improved, they didn't think that he, he was to the, to the standard. He's come back now. And um, and you never know. Let let's see whether he wants to try and get back again. But the, these a number of these players now in the last four years have crossed my path, and um, and I've uh, or my path I should say singularly, and um, and there, there, I think there's always room for improvement. Yeah, interesting stuff there from the order manager Martin O'Neill speaking to us here in episode 15 of the Off the Ball League of Ireland podcast. Sean Cavan, your name cropped up there. What were your thoughts on uh, what the order manager had to say? Um, we yeah. have. Nice to hear, sort of surprising. I didn't didn't sort of know at the time. He said he went to watch me a couple of times when I was at Fulham. I didn't really know to be honest. So yeah, it was nice nice to sort of know he he took an interest and went to went to a couple of games. Yeah, because it has been, you know, a story told over the last while in a path more worn by League of Ireland players, uh, whether that they've, you know, been in the league and never been away, or in your case been away and come back that, you know, excuse me, the Ireland manager is watching you. We've seen Sean Maguire, we've seen Darrell Horgan, we've seen Andy Boyle, we've seen Graham in recent weeks, one of your close mates, Shane Supple, the Bohemians goalkeeper, is in the squad, having uh, Martin and Roy watched him playing for Bowes against Dundalk last week. So it's, it's a path becoming more worn. You're 24, you're, you're playing you know, really well here in the league. Is that still an ambition of yours, one, to look at the UK, but also Martin has shown that if you're doing well in the league and he thinks you're good enough, he might give you a senior call up as well? Um, yeah, well, obviously I'd. I'd love to play play for my country. I get a senior call, but it's. I think everyone says it, but it's it's, it's true. It's a, it'd be a dream come true. Like as a young lad, I remember watching the World Cups, having all the Ireland jerseys, going to the the games. They're only up the road from my house, so it'd, it'd be a dream come true. And so the UK was, I'd, if something did um, come up like an offer that you couldn't turn down, I, I suppose you'd have to take it. But at the minute, I'm just sort of loving playing football and. The main thing was sort of to get back and join it, and I feel like since I've come home, I've sort of started to enjoy my football again. So, yeah, who who sort of knows what the future holds with with England wise and Ireland wise? But at the minute, I'm just sort of trying to keep my head down and play football. Yeah, just on the team of Ireland for now, and you live in Rings End, just a stone throw from the Aviva Stadium. When you came back to the league, did you know was something like Ireland in your mind? And have you been surprised? I know you know how Greenberg, how good Greenberg is, and Shane Supple's probably the best goalkeeper or one of them in the league as well. But was that something in your thought process at all? And have you been surprised that the Ireland senior coaches are you know given you know the league the attention that I feel it deserves now people might call me League of Ireland biased but there are players in this league who are definitely good enough to be in England and maybe also in and around the international squad I'm not saying put Graham Burke into the Ireland team for World Cup qualifier or put you and I put Shane Subble in but if it's a 40-man squad why not give them a, a, a chance? Yeah to be honest I was sort of surprised um, I for me looking from the outside in it almost looked like I, I remember Sean McGuire that year when he was banging in the goals I think he had like 20 at the midway break and he didn't get in the squad but as soon as he sort of signed for Preston and moved away he was in the squad that's what I, I always felt like but now like you said Graham being involved and um, the ball's keeper Shane Supple being involved there is sort of people in the league like myself maybe other players to look at and say why, why isn't there a pathway there if he's coming to watch games and stuff like that hopefully I can impress yeah, and of course, you're using the League of Ireland pathway now, as you said, to get back and join football again, to get back playing regularly because you moved to, to Fulham in 2011 from Belvedere, age 16. I think you played 21 times or, or so in the seven years there. Loans at Mansfield and, and Hartlepool, where you played under 10 games at each of those clubs. How are you finding being a footballer again in terms of knowing that come the kick-off time on a match night, you're more than likely going to be playing in the League of Ireland, whether it be Ireland, England, wherever it might be, you're playing every week. How are you finding it? Yeah, I've, I've loved it. You, you can't beat that sort of feeling of being, being sort of coming to a match day and knowing you're wanted and knowing you, you're sort of, you might have a good chance to play, turning up to the stadium, you get that sort of buzz and you know you're running around to start an 11, you're on the bench, but when you're not, like there was times I wasn't at Fulham, wasn't even in, in an 18, 20-man squad where it's, 
it's just it doesn't really feel like uh, you're involved. You feel like sort of on the outside to to the team, but now you're involved again. Match day is that's what you get judged on, and that's what you've that's what you work all week for. So when it comes to that time, you just need to sort of well. I look forward to it now because I've missed a lot of football over the last few years. True, not being involved, I I sort of relish it. Yeah, and um, I know you didn't play too many games for Mansfield and, and Hartlepool. I think it's uh, seven for Mansfield and nine for Hartlepool. Um, and the fact now you're back here, what's the comparison or how would you compare the leagues, like League 1, League 2, to the league here? You've been in the Shamrock Rovers team, I think, every week bar one since, you, since you've, you've come back. So how would you make the comparison in standard and in, in all that sort of stuff? Um, for me, I feel like there's probably better individual players in, in the League of Ireland. Like you said, Graham does... There's a couple of lads at Dundalk, Cork, who are really good individual players who I think could play easily top of League 2, middle of League 1, top of League 1, I think, comfortably. And they wouldn't look out of place for me. Like, But sort of standard-wise, I think the league is, is up there with League 2, maybe League 1. For me, the teams I've played in in League 2, is, I feel like with like a lot of clubs in the league round would be, be the teams that I played in in League 2. Yeah, I would love to do a social experiment and put Cork, Dundalk, Rovers, Pats, whoever it might be, Derry, into League 1 or League 2 and just see how it would go. I know it would never happen, but it would be an interesting one just to yeah. go and look at. Sean, uh, just finally, we spoke last week on the League of Ireland podcast to uh, Daniel McKenna, another former Belvedere player as well, a couple of years younger than you. About uh, He gave us a perspective of being a young player in England in English Academy and also a little bit about life off the pitch and digs and stuff. You spent... Nine years in England? Uh, seven. Seven years in England from the age of 16 to the age of 23, 24. Football wise, first, you know, playing every day, your technique, all that sort of stuff. How much of a help was that? In a moment, we'll speak about life off the pitch, but just having spent that long there in the Championship at the time, how did you find it and what sort of things were really good about being a professional footballer? Um, for me, it could only help. Like, you're playing with. One of the best things for me was you're playing with the top players. Like, so you, you train with the first team every every day at a championship club. You're playing with people who have been there. They've won leagues. They're international. So you just sort of take little bits from everyone. The senior pros, if you could sort of ask them a couple of questions a day. That's what I sort of tried to do when I got in around the first team. Sort of speak to the senior pros and see what they did off the pitch, on the pitch, see what they did, see how hard they worked and sort of match that. Try and match that, even go beyond it because you're young and you need to prove yourself in the game. They've been there done it so you need to sort of look up to them and get to their levels yeah Fulham I think you would have been in, in the squad with uh, Scott Parker at the time with Damien Duff what was big Brader Hanger on the centre back there as well at the time um, he was there when I was younger so yeah. I sort of they had a good core they had good uh, players Steve Sidwell sort of player Danny Murphy players like that so just sort of I was just look used to look at them and try and see what they did on the pitch off the pitch see could I mirror image that and everybody always says, you know, great football, you're on X number of grand a week, you have a nice car, you have a nice house, all that is great. But footballers do put work in to being footballers, clearly, in terms of their diet, their rest in the gym, you know, playing football matches twice a week in the championship, you know, you're training most mornings, Christmas, Stephen's Day games, New Year's Eve games. It's, it's a life that's interesting, and when you're in it, it's very different to when you're looking at it. Yeah, from the outside, it looks, it look, it looks brilliant, it looks... Everyone probably says to themselves, oh, I want to be that, I want to do that. Obviously, it's nice. You probably get get maybe a little bit more money than people and you're off earlier, but from the time you're in, it's work time. So you're in from nine till, I don't know, half one, two o'clock. It's, there's no messing around. You're in, you're in the gym. You're doing your preparation for training. You can't just rock up at, say, 10 past 10 and train at 20 past 10. You need to put the preparation in and even when you go home, after training and after you do the gym, you need to eat right, get your sleep right. You need to do everything right to give yourself the best chance you can. Yeah, and I'm sure that's helped you now at Shamrock Rovers. I know uh, everyone at Shamrock Rovers is hugely professional as well. From on the pitch, uh, Sean, to off the pitch, uh, and you were in England, as we said, for seven years, so you spent you know five years of your adult life there in the comparison to Dan last week. He's only turning 19, so most of his time there was as a teenager. What's it like as an adult in the UK? And also in recent years, in your, your last bit of time there, you had a, a young son who was living in Dublin. Um, yeah, that was probably the toughest uh, sort of phase for me over there when when uh, Freddie was born. He obviously stayed in Dublin and I was over there and I wasn't in the team and that was sort of the toughest because I was still, obviously you have to be in every day. You have to train every day. You have to play 
play games if you're not on the game you're playing a reserve game on a Monday night away so you can't really get home on the weekends and stuff like that so that was sort of the toughest phase for me but yeah I think it sort of held me in good stead to come home now see him every day and made me sort of want it even more to play play football and play some good stuff and life in general away from being a, a footballer in England is it and again from talking to Dan he you know what do you do I play FIFA mm. I watch Netflix for people a little older is it similar is it a bit of golf a bit of snooker yeah. is it you know going for coffee with the lads you know are, are a lot of the players mates away from the pitch how does all that work um, I would say a, a lot of the lads are quite close I, I lived in the same building um, as another lad so me and him got quite close like every day after training we'd go for a coffee and then I got there was a little group of us, maybe four or five of us that had a little golf group. So on days off or if we had if we finished early we might go for a game of golf. So that sort of kept me occupied and then at night time I was just sort of cooking my dinner and Netflix like Dan said is sort of big uh, big saviour. Are you a good golfer? Yeah. I can hit the ball, I can get around the course, but I wouldn't say I'm wouldn't say I'm great. And I know footballers who play golf are quite competitive about it because yeah. If you're a footballer, you're a competitive person. You play golf, you play tiddlywinks, you want to win. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, even now, there's, since I've come home, I got out for, with Graham for a few games of golf and it is a bit competitive towards the end of the end of the 18, see who wins. But yeah, anything you sort of do, you want to you want to win, don't you? You want to be competitive. Yeah, we spoke to Graham a couple of weeks ago and I asked him if he was good at FIFA as he was at football and he said no. What's he like at golf? Yeah, he's not bad. He's decent, to be fair. Um yeah, he's, he's good, he can get around the course. He's obviously, I think he's better at football than he is at golf now. But um, yeah, he's he's good golfer. I enjoy enjoy the games. Now, your answer is not to be fish, right? What's your uh, speciality? Because when you're in England, you've got to learn to cook, you've mm. got to learn to clean, you've got to learn to iron, to do everything, make your bed, the whole thing. What's the, the Sean Cavan speciality in, um, the, in the kitchen? I like doing, uh, I like doing a steak. Okay. And maybe a little bit of sweet potato fries. That if, I was, had to, if I had to rely on one meal, I'd, that'd be my go to. Medium well, no blood or what's uh, that? No, I don't don't like the blood. I'm sorry, the medium to well, the blood can the blood can stay away from me. Nice, nice. Uh, Sean Cavan, very finally, want to talk about your young man whose name is Freddie. Yeah. Um, I know we spoke just after you'd come home, and I think you'd made your debut, and you could have scored in the game. I can't really remember, and you were saying that he was quite young and he wasn't going to get to all the games. Now it's the summertime; he might come to watch you a bit more. Um, and he loved watching you play. Yeah, he, he actually went to the Watford game, and he was there last night. Got him like a little Rovers jacket, and he he got his like he has his football shoes now. So any game he goes to, he like yesterday before the game, I said to him, "Oh, do you want to go to the match?" And he said, "Yeah." And he was like, "Oh, can I put my football shoes on?" So he loves putting on his football shoes and his rain jacket, and he loves watching the matches. He's he's brilliant to have there. I hope Rovers gave you a jacket for free, huh? Um, <laughs> but it is cool. I'm, and there were some great photos last week when Leinster and the rugby won the European Champions Cup of the players and their wives with their kids on the pitch and some of them you know, putting the kids in the trophy and putting the kids mm. beside the trophy as well. Do you enjoy playing more when you know you're a little fella? I know he's only very young. How old is he? Uh, he's three now. So he, he's, he's old enough to know his dad's playing yeah. football. Do you enjoy him and, you know, and when you know he's there you might give him a wave coming out and you might see him afterwards and stuff? Yeah, I love it. Like Even the Watford game and last night I know exactly where my family sits so every every game like when we line up and wave up and there's nothing better than seeing his little hand waving down at you. It gives you sort of, all oh, right, now it's it's go time. I need to go for him. Like so, yeah, that's that's the one one part of what I love. Will he be at Daily Mount on Friday, or is that too mad for him? Uh, no, I might keep him away from that one. I might, uh, I might uh, ask my brother to mind him for the night. He might be on babysitting duty, but I think he's he's gonna try and do mascot for the Dundalk game. So. Yeah, I look forward to that, but I might keep away from Daily Mount. Yeah, but it might not be a bad show at all together. Uh, Sean, just finally on that and being back near him and your missus and your mum and your dad and your family and, and being in Dublin, how much of a, a, it's clearly a difference, but how much of a plus is that for you in your football that you know when you come home you're not going back to your apartment on your own all day that you've got people to, you know, people to see things to do and stuff. And as you said, even on a match day on Friday, you've got the distraction, it's a great distraction of your son, bring him to crash, collect him from crash. It's not sitting there all day thinking... Oh, we're playing balls tonight. Yeah. What am I going to do? Like, yeah, for me, that's I enjoy the uh, distraction. For me, if I was just to sit around the house all day, like I did sometimes in uh, London, I'd start to think too much about the game. But like I said, having him there and I might even have a little kick around with him before I go to the game is is a nice distraction for me. So it takes your mind off. But you know, when you get to the stadium, then you then you sort of clued in.
Is he a left footer like his dad? No, he's right footed, so I need to need to have a word with him, get him on the left foot. <laughs> Sean Cavanagh, thanks many for coming in. No problem. Yeah, great stuff there from Shamrock Rover, Sean Cavanagh. Really interesting on uh, life back here as a hoop and also his life in the UK as well. The very best of luck uh, to Cabo this Friday. Great Dublin Derby. Bowls against Shamrock Rovers taking place at 7.45 in Dalyman Park. That is our focus on the Premier Division. We bring you fixtures and results in a few minutes. On, but yeah, it's time now for our first division focus on the Off the Ball League of Ireland podcast. It's episode 15 here with Jamie Moore. I'm very happy to welcome Shane Keegan back to the podcast. Shane, manager of Galway United. How are you? Yeah, not bad at all yourself. Great, thanks Shane. Thanks for having a chat with us. Now, firstly, your most recent game on Sunday was a 2-1 win away to Cabin Tealy. Robbie Williams and Mark Ludden scored your goals in the first half. It came to the 88th minute and there was an incident involving your goalkeeper, a free kick and a bizarre goal by Keith Dalton. Please talk us through your view of what happened because it's one of the most interesting pieces of League of Ireland footage I've seen. <laughs> yeah, we've certainly got uh, plenty of publicity on the back of it anyway. It seems to have gone, gone viral worldwide by, by the looks of things, Jerry. Yeah, look, um, I suppose there, there's been a long ball over the top and, and, and Tiger, our goalkeeper, has gone out to collect it. And uh, one of the Cabin TV players is coming in to close him down. He loses his foot, in fairness. It's a complete accident. He loses his foot and, and uh, his, his, his standing leg goes from underneath him and, and comes into the kind of meta area there on uh, on Tig. Tig mistakenly um, presumes that the free has been given, which we all thought the free would be given, and puts the ball down just to check in his ankle, at which stage the ref, I think, possibly thinks he's just trying to run down the clock, tells him to get up and get on with it. He picks the ball back up, ref blows the whistle to say it's a free, and uh, while Tyke is there um, kind of trying to plead his innocence, they take a quick one and knock it in, so it was... uh, yeah, it was a strange situation, so it was. I think I think Tyke was, was certainly hard done by not to get his free out, but also I think he learned a lesson as soon as that whistle went, really, I need him to, to pick that ball out into the car park, you know, to make sure that uh, what happened can't happen, you know. Yeah, I was interested as well because I wasn't sure. Apparently earlier in the match he'd maybe done the same thing, picked up the ball, put it down, picked it up again, and the free wasn't given. But I was certainly uh, on my own Twitter during the week saying, surely the referee needs to blow the whistle to signal for the free kick to be taken, given that it's so close to the goal. And we see all the time in the league now, the referee will never allow a quick free kick, really, unless he blows the whistle. So if that goal had been a crucial one to make it 2-2 and you would have dropped two points there, I'm sure you would have been hugely disappointed in the fact that the ref maybe didn't blow the whistle. Or would you say fair play to Cabin Tealy for taking it quickly? In a boat, I suppose, really, Jay. You, you, I would certainly have issues with the referee and how he handled the situation. Yeah, that's, that's certainly for true. Um, but yeah, you, you certainly can't uh, give out about the initiative of, of Cabin TV to take advantage of the situation. I've no problem with them doing what they did. And as I say, um, Ty, in fairness to him, you know, it's 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 one for uh, a lesson in the bank, I suppose. So it is. We're very, very lucky on the day, Jay. We're very poor on the day. Cabin TV were the better side. I have no problem in saying that. And to be honest with you, Ty kept us in the game up until then. So uh, he's uh, he's he's uh, he's more than clear in terms of, of credit in the bank on that one, that's for sure. Yeah, of course, a very important win as well, Shane. As you mentioned, it leaves you in third in the table, level on points with draw to 24 points each from 12 games played. And your uh, records are identical in seven wins, three draws and two defeats. And the game against each other this season in United Park was a 2-2 draw as well. You face each other at Eamon DC Park this Friday at 7.45. A huge game for both teams. And as I said, the record's going in identical. So it's been hard to separate the team so far this season. What do you see as the keys to you guys coming out on top this Friday? Yeah, um, I, I suppose if you look at the game up there, even that that game up there was was a very very strange one. I mean, Drogheda are a really really solid side. They've got a very very good balance, I suppose, of of, of experience and youth. Um, the two boys in 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 the back, um, Darren Kelly and 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 uh, and Connor Kane. If you look at the two of them, I think they've been absolutely excellent, and obviously they've got a bit more experience then around them in terms of. of Barrer and, and Skinner behind him in the goal, and just the whole way up to Sean Brennan and, and, and Chris Lyons. They've got a good balance all over the side, and it's no surprise that they're up where they are. And we were probably very lucky to be two 0 up at half time up there, to be honest with you. Um, and you couldn't begrudge them their, their their draw in the end of the game. You know what we can do to we we have our our own ideas as to not weaknesses but areas that we would hope to try and get at them. I know they were at the game watching us against Cavan the other day. They can't put me that. Uh, they can't both be confident after seeing us against Cavendish the other day. That's for sure, you know. 
Yeah, and if we look at the way the league has gone, Shane, with you know UCD at the top, currently five points ahead of yourselves and uh, Drada, we've then got Finn Harps uh, three points behind. You've got Shells, Longford, who uh, we both saw in action uh, in Longford on Saturday evening. It's a fascinating race for us neutrals watching from the outside. How have you seen it so far? And I suppose, what do you feel are the key areas for you guys to ensure that come the end of the season, you're either top of the league or certainly in that top four? Because it seems to me, watching all of the games, that they're all... 50-50 matches and whoever plays better on the day will win and that's what I really enjoyed about the game the other night in Longford with you know 85 minutes gone 1-1 both teams were still trying to win the match which probably shows you know how everybody feels three points against these rivals could really help your, your cause Yeah I mean all it's, 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 I don't think you'll ever see a season which I mean I'm sure the other managers will say the same thing I've said which is that every pretty much Every elite, probably two out of every three games you've got, you've got the whole world telling you this is a huge one, this is a huge one. But you keep hearing that everyone is a huge one because it, it seems to be constantly against a, a, a game against the team that's immediately around you. I suppose we would have highlighted two things in, in terms of, of trying to, to be as close to the top as we possibly can from the end of it. One is home form, um, which thankfully has been really, really good for us so far. We've had one draw and won all the rest of them. Um, and the other that we would have highlighted was, was trying to be as defensively solid as, as possible. They, we've, we've spoken before about the quality strikers in this division, but trying to be as, as defensively solid as possible. And um, four games leading into, into Sunday, I mean, we'd hardly cop up a decent chance, to be honest with you. We've been defensively, we've been absolutely support for, for the four games since our poor performance up in Shells. And that was what was so frustrating about Sunday. Sunday, we were absolutely all over the place, so we were. So, uh, so we're trying to figure out the reasons behind that and make sure it was just a blip and make sure we get back to that good defensive solidity that we had previously because we needed to try the night. Yeah, of course, and it's so interesting as well this, this season, the league. Every single team has at least one striker who you would say if they were in the Premier League, they'd score goals. I mean, we don't need to list them off. You know, UCD have Georgie Kelly, draw to have Chris Lyons. You guys have Danny Furlong. Finn Harps have Kieran O'Connor. We've got Shells, Longford, even, you know, Cabin Teeley, who are very far down the table, Kieran Marty Waters, and, and, and so on. We should mention Joe Doyle as well. It's a league full of very good strikers and I think that's what's made it so exciting is that it, in, in general in the games if a chance has come these guys have taken them and you'll be hopeful in your case that you know someone like Danny Furlong can do it in your uh, attack and third on Friday but you need to also be aware up the other end someone like Chris Lyons who's so used to scoring goals in this league the games are really great because both teams have great firepower. That's it. It'd be very interesting to see come the end of the season. I, I reckon it'll, it'll have to be one of the, the, the highest scoring seasons um, and that's down to the quality that's there. I mean, that's even, you know, we'd like to think that we, we potentially have two of them on McCormick isn't too far behind Danny Furlong in terms of goals scored for us. Um, and then the other one, maybe even that we're missing out there is young Aaron Dobbs down at Wexford is another one. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a massive, massive test. So it is. It really is a massive test every every week. Um, players have to be, the centre-backs have to be at their absolute best to try and get on top of these battles. And I suppose when we look at our win over UCD, which no doubt was our most impressive performance so far this year. I think uh, Robbie Williams' kind of individual battle with Georgie Kelly that night and Robbie having certainly probably his, his outstanding game of the season and, and doing so well at Georgie, that, that probably swung the balance in our favour. And um, I think you'll find most most games, the, the centre-half's ability to deal with the opposition centre-forward is going to be a, a massive determining factor in the final score, you know? Yeah, a huge win, 2-0 over UCD at home last week as well, which uh, closed the gap to five points. Shane, as a manager, you know, in the league last year in the Premier Division, Galway struggled and I'm sure you didn't always enjoy the games and, and exactly what was going on because the results weren't always fantastic. What's it like this season to be in the league as a manager towards the top and managing in these games? Like after this match, you go and play Longford, you've just played UCD and so on. There's such interesting games for everybody to be involved in. What are it actually like to manage in when maybe a decision you make, the team you pick or something along those lines could also be a key factor in, in picking up a win or losing the game? Yeah, look, there's no point saying otherwise. It's certainly a highly, highly pressurised environment, that's for sure. Um, so it is, as I say, every... World and its mother likes to tell you how important each game is, and, and the right as well as every game that you're heading into is, is a big one, and um, it's also tight up there. But I, I suppose the one thing you, you try and do, and not always successfully, and, and even though it wasn't a game against one of the teams immediately around us, I suppose it's, it's something I've been trying to looking back this week, think I didn't do too successfully this week, was trying to, if you can at all, say, stay emotionally detached from it. Um, the game is of such high importance that. You're, you, you tend to get wrapped up in what's immediately going on in front of you and, and I suppose the saying is you can't see the wood through the trees and you, you do your video analysis during the week and you look back at things and you're 
you're shaking your head trying to figure out how the hell you didn't see that on the night or you know how you didn't did that that, that didn't stand out to you and you didn't react to such a thing so I think that I think in in such a high pressurized environment and with such important games I, I do think the ability to uh to try and stay somewhat detached from it, if at all possible, so that you can clinically analyse what's going on in front of you and make the alterations you need to. I think, I think that's of huge importance, you know. Is that an easy thing to do, and how do you do it? Absolutely not. Um, and as I say, I don't know if you're asking me at the right time, how do you do it? I certainly didn't do it this week. Uh, the referee as well is another thing that can really make it, your, your concentration on a game go out the window, and I, I think I was certainly guilty of that on Sunday as well, when you're unhappy with the referee, and that can start to, to, to cloud your ability to... Uh, to view the game properly and, 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 and analyse it in a correct way. I mean, to be honest with you, Jamie, I'm a huge fan, and even though I'm not doing it, I'm a huge fan of, of the concept of, of, of a manager being in the stand. I really, really am. Um, I think, look, I sat beside you last Saturday night. I, I have no doubt we could see things from our vantage point that, that neither of the two lads could see down on the sideline. But the culture around the game of soccer is, you know, you're, you're in the trenches, you're there where your players need you, they need to be able to contact to talk to you face to face at all times they need to be able to see you as a form of reassurance and that culture dictates that you do you really do I suppose have to, to be in the dugout um, but in terms of, of actually analysing the game and, and, and making the correct decisions as the game goes on I think, I think being in the stand is, is probably has an advantage on it you know Yes, as you mentioned there, the uh, famous referees and the fourth officials as well, the bane of every manager's life. And uh, some of them in the league, not too good, it must be said. Some are decent, some uh, not so good as well, which, as you said, does get uh, under the, uh, the hair of the managers. No pun intended, because we know Shane Keegan doesn't actually have any hair, which is why he wears a cap. Uh, Shane, very finally, you mentioned we were uh, both uh, in Longford on Saturday watching the Shells against Longford match. Um, Ollie Horgan from Finn Harps was there. Tim Clancy from Drada was there. There could have been a couple of other managers that we didn't see, but it's a very common occurrence because uh, both Longford and Cove play on Saturdays that a lot of the managers will go and watch. How much importance do you place on physically being able to watch the opposition teams yourself? How do you use that in preparation with your own team? And how does your wife find you being on the road every Saturday to different parts of the country away from her and, and your little fella? Because I know League of Ireland managers uh, have to get a lot of grace from their, their wives and girlfriends to, to be able to spend so much time on the road and, and away from home, not just training and coaching your own team, but also watching other games. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. No, firstly, I suppose, I, I do think it's massively important, Jamie, yeah. Um, for a couple of reasons. Obviously, primarily for preparation to know the style of play the opposition are going about and, and particular set pieces that they're using and who danger men are and all of that kind of thing. It's also massively important that when you finish your final training session of, of the week, that your team feel, yeah, manager has gone to every length possible to make sure we're as fully prepared for this game as, as possible. You might go to watch an opposition team and you might give very little of what you actually saw back to the players because you don't want to be overburdening them with information. But they know you were there the fact that you might have only given them one or two pointers means they know you were there and they know that you were doing everything that, that, that you could to get them get them prepared. So it is, it's, it's really, really important. Um, in terms of, of the time it takes, look, there's lots of things that people can, can do with their lives. An awful lot of people spend their, their, their Saturday nights in the pub, I suppose. It's, it's probably, if you count on one hand, the amount of times I get to see an inside of a pub and... Uh, that probably balances out, I suppose, over the course of the amount of time that I'm in, I'm in Longford and Cove. But yeah, it does rely on her being a bit patient, but you just have to make sure that if you're, you're giving up the final third of your, your Saturday to, uh, to travel to Cove or Longford, that you're putting the first two thirds in with family time at home. It's a very important balance, you know. Shane Keegan, as always, thanks a million. The best of luck on Friday. We'll speak to you soon. Cheers, Jay. Thank you. That is the Galway manager Shane Keegan speaking to us on episode 15 of the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast. It's Jamie Moore here. We're going to move now from Shane to a man who uh, we think and hope will be in the Drada team against his Galway team this Friday. It's at Eamon DC Park at 7.45. It's Galway against Drada. Second v third. Both teams level on points on 24 each. Kieran Kelly signed for Drada from uh, St. Pat's under 19s at the start of the season. He's been an almost ever present in their team. Eight just 19. Left footed centre back. Really, really positive player, positive addition to the league, and uh, has a, a possible chance to have a great career in the League of Ireland. He joins us now on the podcast. Um, Kieran, firstly, just explain to me how you found the transition from being an under 19 player at St. Pat's for the previous couple of seasons, albeit a small bit of first team experience, to now being a regular in the team at Drada, playing every week in matches that matter in a very important league. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's going well for me at the moment. I'm uh, playing, as you said, playing a couple of games at the start of the season. And trying to full time, so I think it's going well. But the step up from the ninth team to the senior team is it is difficult. Like the physicality is much more, it's much more better, and 
even just being clever on the pitch is just a lot more difficult than uh, the 19s. But having been with the patch, nine, patch first team come to the end of last season, it's, it really has helped me come into draw the first team and go get getting on well. Yeah, you had, of course, some experience with St. Pat's first team last year as well. Interested there, you mentioned that in the first division, a lot of the players are much more clever, which is quite natural because they're older and they've been playing the game a lot longer. Maybe just explain to me a little bit more about that and the challenge that that, that has posed to you when you're playing against older players who are cute, are clever, and who are trying things that maybe players at 19s or 17s definitely wouldn't. Yeah, it's just small things like even going up for headers and all that give you a little nudge before the ball comes to put you off balance and stuff like that. And like when you're winning games one nil to the end of the game, like they're just keeping the ball, getting in the corners and just seeing out the game, being clever about it that way. Yeah, and I suppose when you were playing under nineteen football, you would have been, you know, a senior player, one of the older ones in the group and having been involved in the Pat's first team as well, it you know, probably would have been you who was, you know, employing those tricks in 19s games and now you're the younger one and you're kind of learning them very quickly from your own teammates and the players who you're playing against as well yeah definitely definitely there's a lot of, a lot of senior players that's right a lot of young players as well but the senior players are helping the young players out and it's really good there at the moment yeah of course apart from the mental side of things the physical you know part of the game is huge particularly in the first division you would be what 6 foot 3 maybe more 6 foot 4 are you Six foot two, yeah. Six, six foot, foot two, two okay. You know. Six foot two. I'm making you too tall, but yeah. On just on that, you, you're quite tall. You're strong as well. But have you found that it's a challenge from a physical point of view as well? Yeah, definitely. Like coming from the 19s, like it, you obviously don't have to be that physical. But going straight to the first team, like I've been in the gym now since the start of the season, working on the physicality because you come up against strong strikers and you need to be physical every game, no matter who you're playing. And in terms of trying to adapt to the league that you're playing in now very quickly. I know I was at the opening game of the season when you guys beat at loan. I think yeah. it was 6 nil. That was probably an easy introduction for you. But how did you adapt and how have you found the adaptation so quickly having been in the team for all the games to, you know, realise that now I'm actually playing regular football in a men's league? Yeah, well, I like to think that's one of my strong points going into any team. I like to adapt quick and get to know what I need to do, what my job is. And coming in beside Kevin Farrell, my... Uh, partnership as the back there, centre backs. He's really helped me like come in and settle down, and as you said, that that's quick. The other main change is you're now playing in matches where points matter every Friday or every Monday or wherever you're playing games, and particularly you know this season with the first division as competitive as it is, I love watching it because there's so many fifty fifty games. But that's been a definite change for you, where you know if you're playing nineteens and you play a bad pass out from the back and you make a mistake, it doesn't really matter. Whereas at first team level, it matters hugely. There's points on the line, there's fans there, there's people's jobs on the line as well. It's a it's a totally different ball game, really. Yeah, especially being so high up on the table as well at the moment, it's it's great. Like the top of the table is so so high at the moment with ourselves, UCD and Galway and Harps and Shells like nearly on the same point. So. Every 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 win is just brilliant, and every point like you need to, you need to get on the board. Like saying our, our next three matches, Galway, Canteen, and Shell, the last the last days we only got two points out of those games, so we can't really be tripping up against uh, the likes of the so called smaller teams like Canteen and stuff. But every game is every game is tough, like you said. And one mistake could cost you. Yeah, that's Rotter defender Kieran Kelly speak to us here in episode fifteen of the Off the Ball League of Ireland podcast. You'll find that full interview in the podcast section of offtheball.com. Another fascinating weekend ahead in the first division. Just briefly, the results from uh, last weekend. Draw had a two, Wexford nil, which uh, we spoke in depth to uh, Kieran Kelly about there. A big win for Tim Clancy's team. Chris Lyons and Sean Brennan got the goals there. They finished UCD three at Lone Town, nil at the UCD Bowl. An important win for UCD to bounce back from that defeat to Galway the previous weekend. Their top scorer, Georgie Kelly, put them ahead five minutes before half-time, but it took two late goals on 90 and 91 minutes from Jay McClelland and Dara O'Connor to uh, really secure the points there, so uh, Athlone didn't do too badly. Finn Harps nil, Cove one was the uh, result up in Finn Park. Keen Leonard getting the winner for Cove in the 22nd minute. We were speaking last week to Ollie Horgan from Finn Harps. The trip, Cove to Finn Harps. What a long trip that would be. So well done to Cove for that game. One game on Saturday, a match I was at, it finished Longford one, Shelburne won. Uh, uh, Lo- Shells took the lead, should we say, through David O'Sullivan in the 50th minute, but uh, the equaliser scored by Dylan McLeod, a fantastic goal in the 61st minute. One game as well on Sunday afternoon, it was a three o'clock kickoff in Stradbrook. Uh, it finished as we spoke with Shane there. Cabin Teeley won, Galway two. 
Robbie Williams and Mark Ludden had Cabo 2 0 up, but that bizarre goal by Keith Dalton uh, got one back for Cabo in the 89th minute. Fixtures this weekend, all the games taking place on Friday, and uh, four of them are 7.45 kickoffs. It's El Clasico of the Midlands at Lone against Longford in the Lone Town Stadium. A Dublin Derby in Stradbrook as UCD make the visit to Cabin Tilly. It's Cove against Shells, Galway v Drada as we spoke about, and Wexford FC against Finn Harps. That game is taking place at 8pm. Really looking forward to another fascinating weekend of the First Division. We're sure that that race may go all the way to the wire. Now, a couple of other stories to finish us off on this week's podcast before we go through the fixtures in the Premier Division. Uh, the front page of the goals pull out in the Sun newspaper on Wednesday is a photo of the uh, Bohemians goalkeeper Shane Supple who has been called up to the Ireland senior squad for the first time um, for Martin O'Neill but for these uh, friendly matches coming up against France and the USA. Uh, Shane has been speaking to Neil O'Reardon and he's revealed that he has quit playing Gaelic football which is an interesting one. Shane, uh, of course, uh, stopped playing football for a number of years between 2009 and 2015 when he came home from Ipswich Town, played football for St. Bridget's GAA. He's only recently uh, just finished up playing. Uh, he played for them as recently as six weeks ago in a defeat against Ballymun Kickens, but he's revealed in the goals pull out in the sun that uh, he's finished playing. He says, I finished playing the Gaelic, and uh, he goes on to uh, uh, speak a little bit about, I can't do it anymore, I can't give the time. It's not fair on Bowes. They've been uh, so good to me down the last couple of years uh, to let me play. I want to concentrate on football for the next few years and give it a right go, look after my body and get the most out of it. So uh, the very best of luck to Shane. So we're going to speak to him hopefully on next week's uh, League of Ireland podcast after those games uh, for Ireland against France and the USA if he manages to play. He's also revealed how he found out he was in the squad and he says... Um, he heard that Martin O'Neill had mentioned something in a press conference last week uh, after the Celtic game, but then he got a call from Keith Long to say an email had come in. I told him to stop taking the mick, but he sent it on to me, and then I knew it was real. Of course, David Ford made his Ireland senior day, but at the age of 31, he went on to make 11 caps uh, for Ireland. Um, and uh, He went on to say that it's a bit out of the blue. There are lots of injuries. That's why I've been called in, according to Shane So, but I'm going to go and enjoy it and give it a lash. I'm going to believe, and I love this, I'm going to believe I'm going in as the best goalkeeper there I'm not going to take it as seriously as I would have when I was in England. It's not the be-all and the end-all. There are other things in life. As much as I love football, it helps when you have that awareness. So best of luck to Shane Supple, um, who was in that Ireland squad. And it's 10 years since he uh, pulled on an Ireland jersey uh, featuring for the Ireland under-21s in March 2008. He quit football six years uh, for, for six years before returning in 2015. Now, we're going to stay in the team of goalkeepers. And for the first time in League of Ireland history... Two Canadian goalkeepers face each other in a match at Tallis Stadium on Tuesday night that I was at. It finished Shamrock Rovers 3, St. Pat's Neil. Shamrock Rovers were really fantastic in the game, played really well. They had Tomer Chensinski in goal for them, uh, while St. Pat's had Tyson Farrago in goal because uh, Barry Murphy uh, was away due to the birth of uh, his son. His wife uh, was in labour. So yeah, there's Tomer Chensinski and uh, Tyson Farrago, as you can see on your screens there. So the first time in League of Ireland history that two Canadian goalkeepers have faced each other between the sticks. So yeah, well done to the two lads there. Now, if you're a, a footballer, a professional footballer, right, and uh, you get in a bit of trouble, you might get a fine. Well, this was the case for the Waterford goalkeeper, Lawrence Figaro. Uh, it's been confirmed that he's going to go back to Swindon Town. He's been alone from Swindon uh, with uh, Waterford uh, since the start of the season. But um, Alan Reynolds in the newspaper today has confirmed that um, Vigaro is going back to Swindon. The Robins gaffer, Phil Brown, and goalkeeping coach Dean Thornton were at Oriel Park on Monday night to uh, watch Vigaro, who's 24, impress in Waterford's 2-0 defeat to Dundalk. Uh, but the uh, Waterford manager has confirmed that Vigaro is going back uh, to his club, so he's going to stick with Niall Corbett, who was the number one before Lawrence came along, and Matt Connor as well. Anyway, the story is when Vigaro was playing for Swindon, he was on loan from Liverpool. He was given a £50 fine by the manager at the time for being late for training. And uh, he wasn't too impressed with being fined. So instead of you know paying 50 quid with a 50 quid note or just you know instructing the club to take it out of his wages, what he did was he went to the bank, he went to the cashier, and he took out 5,000 1p coins and paid his fine to his manager by dropping the coins one by one on the manager's desk. So yeah, that's probably not the way to uh, be behaving with your manager. But yeah, an interesting way that uh, Lawrence Vigaro decided to pay that fine by paying uh, 50 quid in 5,000 1p coins. Now, our final port of call on this week's League of Ireland podcast is a story involving a star League of Ireland player who unfortunately will not be playing his League of Ireland football for too much longer. It's Ronan Curtis from Derry City uh, who was signed for Portsmouth. English uh, League One side Portsmouth have completed the signing of Republic of Ireland under-21 winger Ronan Curtis from Derry City. The attacker will land at Fratton Park on a two-year deal 
for an undisclosed fee following a very public pursuit. They'll have to wait until June 9th when the international transfer window opens before he can sign for them. He's out of contract in Derry this summer, but because he's uh, 24, they will get a fee in terms of compensation as well. So the very best of luck to uh, Ronan Curtis, who's been a fantastic player here in the League of Ireland. And he may not be the only player from Derry City who ends up as well, um, or sorry, for, uh, yeah, ends up as well in the UK because a couple of their players, Aaron McAniff and others, have been in really, really impressive form this season. It's time for the... Um, Finally, fixtures of the Premier Division for this week and uh, interesting weekend. What a Dublin derby to look forward to. Bowes against Shamrock Rovers an 8 o'clock, a 7.45 kickoff. Should I say that game is in Dalyman Park this coming Friday evening again that Sean Cavanagh will be playing in. At the same time, it's Dundalk against bottom of the table. Bray, Sligo Rovers face Limerick. That's a really important game. Both teams, of course, uh, towards the bottom of the table. Both level on 16 points, in fact, as well, uh, occupying the uh, last relegation promotion playoff spot. So uh, that is a, a six-pointer, if ever there was. And that's a, an important game for both teams as well. And, you know, you, you would really think if either of them can win the match, it would certainly give them a chance to, to move away from uh, Bray, who are currently eight ahead of already in the league. It's in Pats against Cork City in Richmond Park. That game also at 7.45. Well, Derry City travelled to Waterford in the RSC also at a quarter to eight. Uh, that's a third against fourth. So some really fascinating and interesting fixtures to look forward to uh, on the next weekend of the SSE Electricity League. If you can, folks, go and get to a game because, as we know, it is the hashtag greatest league in the world. And we will have uh, updates and analysis across uh, 98 FM, Today FM and news talk on Off The Ball across the weekend. That is it for episode 15 of the Off The Ball League of Ireland podcast. Thanks so much for uh, watching and listening. Thanks to Sean Cavanagh for joining us in studio as well as the Galway manager, Shane. Keegan and Kieran Kelly from Drada. We're back on OffTheBall.com next Wednesday and if you missed any of the podcast you can listen to it in full in the podcast section of OffTheBall.com you'll also be able to watch it on our YouTube channel. Have a great weekend folks and we'll chat to you later. See you. Bye bye.